Wow, wow, wow. So beautiful. I was thinking how when I was a, a student here, I had a class with my Bible professor and I said, so what is heaven going to be like? And he said, it'll be like an endless worship service. And I said, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. Because it's never that great. <laughs> but this is great. Gosh, if we could just keep going on and hearing these talks, goodness gracious, and the music. Thank you, George, Anna, the Sprays team. Let's give thanks to them. That's if they keep just bringing great stuff. I also want to thank the unsung heroes, the Ken A.V. guys in the back. Ben, Daniel, we take you for granted until it doesn't work. <laughs> but you make it work every year. So, our next presenter is an Anglican priest in the Anglican Church in North America. She's from um, that wonderful country just south of us, Texas. <laughs> I think they seceded, I'm not sure. <laughs> she is a, an amazing writer and speaker. She has done so in many incredible things. Um, her first book, Liturgy of the Ordinary, won Christianity Today's Book of the Year. She's an award-winning author. <laughs> and then her second book, Prayer in the Night, also won Christianity Today's Book of the Year. And I thought, greedy, just, <laughs> do you, how, how many do you need? How, I don't know what the, anyway. <laughs> she's such a good writer. She's currently writing. She writes for Christianity Today regularly. She writes for the New York Times. She's really helping uh, reach audiences that wouldn't be reached with a beautiful message. Um, she's my friend, and she's going to come now to this stage. Let's give a nice, warm tag welcome, Tish Harrison Warren. So good to be here. I uh, I love the Apprentice Gathering. I don't go to many of the many of these like I don't travel much anymore. But I will always say yes to Jim uh, as long as I can um, because he's a good friend. Because he's a good um, you kind of are my people, and um, also because uh, I'm a huge fan of Rich Mullins. I I. I'll tell you about, um, if you want, I, I told the last Apprentice Gathering, so I won't repeat the story, but I came on a pilgrimage here in my early 20s. That's the first time I was at Friends. And also because I'm a huge fan of Kansas. And I say that because every time I say that to someone from Kansas, they go, you are? <laughs> um, but I am, love Kansas. It's kind of the underdog state, and I'm rooting for it, and I love it. <laughs> And uh, I am super Texan, seventh generation on both sides of my family, uh, which just means my people are very oppressive. But I am, um, <laughs> but that's my people. And they, but if I, so I want to stay there, but if I, if I had to move, Kansas would be near the top of the list. Um, <laughs> so, um, and I just, <laughs> I got to get to my talk, but I, I want to say I was talking to Jim last night, it was giving me a hard time about the award-winning author thing. And I said, well, you know, I have two of these CT book awards. You can just take my old one if you want. <laughs> and he was like, shut up. <laughs> Get out. We don't even want to hear you. Um, all right, so I, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. Let's pray. Lord, you are in the midst of us. We are called by your name. Jesus, we're here, we are gathered here because we long to know you. And our hearts are in a thousand places. We have a thousand different conflicting motivations. None of us come here pure. But 
you have made us your own. And where else can we go? You hold the words of eternal life. Lord, thank you that you long to meet us more than we long to meet you. Come and show us your kindness, your glory. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I'm going to jump right in because I have I kind of have a lot to cover this morning. So I want to begin... If you would, you could close your eyes if you want to. You don't have to. But just kind of in your imagination, I want us to together kind of peer into an early church worship service. We're just going to look in to our ancient brothers and sisters who we will be spending eternity with and see how they worshiped. So first you'd see people standing with their hands raised or kneeling, um, they would dress in a different way for worship, possibly, than they do, in terms of like head covering, and that sort of thing. Their hands are lifted in prayer, folks are kneeling, some might be laying down, um, prostrate, which is a word I always get wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uterus prostate uh, <laughs> so <laughs> um, alright I just blew it there but okay let's go let's go back <laughs> their hands are lifted they're kneeling they're all facing the same direction and that's not towards the speaker or preacher that's towards east they're all facing east because Eden was planted in the east. Because as Gregory of Nyssa said in the fourth century, we faced east in prayer because we were remembering and looking for our ancient fatherland, which Christ will restore when he comes again. They faced east to remember the resurrection. Leaders in the church taught about which cardinal direction you should be facing when you're praying. I don't even know which way east is. I thought about telling you to face east. I don't know where it is. I couldn't even do that. But you are. I'm not. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, they were facing. <laughs> that's how the that's how the, the the worship leader would not be looking at you. They would be facing east. At times, you would see folks kissing each other. They're eating bread and drinking wine. They're singing or chanting. They're bowing. Alms are being placed in the hands of the poor, in their actual hands. It's a profoundly physical and embodied service. People are moving around. People are up and down. People are touching each other and, and close to one another. You can smell one another. Worship, historically, is not only something we do with our minds. It is something and maybe primarily something that we do with our bodies. And one way to tell the story of modernity, not the only way to tell it, but one way to tell it, it's to say that modernity has been the process of forgetting that bodies matter. James K.A. Smith says that at least since Descartes, modern people have primarily thought of ourselves as thinking things. That's mostly what we are, thinking things. He says that um, we imagine ourselves, in his phrase, as brains on a stick. The disappearance of the body's significance has been part of modernity from the beginning. That's all the water that we have sw been swimming in since Descartes, certainly in the um, advent of America. But I want to make the case that the digital age has kind of taken this modern tendency and put it on steroids. 
The great communication theorist, uh, Marshall McLuhan, uh, who's amazing, famously said that, uh, and you guys have heard this, for every technological advance that transforms society, that the medium is the message. Right? Have you heard that? So what does that mean? He means by that that within every medium, every, ev uh, every way that we kind of consume information through um, uh, in a mediator, that um, in the medium is embedded a worldview, a vision of who we are, a vision of what humans are, of what humans are for, of what we should care about, and where we are going. Whatever else is communicated through this medium, the implicit message is also communicated. And more often than not, that implicit message is actually the most powerful message being communicated. And the message of online life, whether it be shopping online or social media or VR, virtual reality, whatever the actual words are that we're consuming, even words about Jesus. Whatever the message is, the, uh, in terms of, of linguistics, in terms of words, the message carried by that medium is that bodies don't matter, is that place doesn't matter, is that matter doesn't matter. And that the kind... Um, and then they, in fact, maybe are sort of in the way, something to be transcended or overcome. We were already um, becoming digital selves, uh, digital souls, I don't think so, digital selves, especially kind of after 2007, the year that the smartphone was invented. My friend Jack Gabig, who's a priest and a liturgic scholar, calls the smartphone the one ring to rule them all. <laughs> um, but even after that, there was some space for trying to kind of preserve things IRL, right, like in real life. But the pandemic happened, and the whole world went online. And I, I need to be very clear about this. I have an elderly mother. My husband has an autoimmune disorder. I have a medical history that made me qualify early for vaccines before my age group. I am a great champion of vaccines. I wore masks. I champion churches going online. My church went online. I wrote lots of pieces that got me in trouble with some folks urging people to wear masks and go online. And I think you should get vaccinated if you can. So I tell you all that. Oh, and I should tell you, I also have strange relationships with close people in my life who are COVID deniers because of my stance in COVID. So I just need to be clear in this kind of contentious polarization that has become of COVID that I take COVID very seriously. So keep all of that in mind when I say that while I think it was necessary, absolutely necessary, but still the reliance on digital communication over the past few years and the hope that we have come to put in digital communication has shaped us and left us broken as a society and a church in many, many ways. I don't know if this could have been avoided or as part of the tragedy of history, but this is what we're recovering from. COVID trained us to see bodies, ours and other people's as a threat and primarily to think of human bodies as a vector of disease. This is not historically how we've understood human bodies and human community. Bodies are not seen as just useless but dangerous. But the societal effects of isolation that this has produced have brought despair and death and they've been devastating. And this has shaped us. This will continue to shape us long after COVID. This is a train that is not stopping anytime soon. The Episcopal Church just launched its first entirely VR service. The tagline is all avatars welcome. This is true. This is happening. 
It, we have digital sacraments for the first time in human history. So I want to say whatever the sermon is about in a VR service, which may be very good and uplifting and important, whatever the passage in scripture being read, the message of the medium is that bodies don't matter and that place doesn't matter, that location doesn't matter, that matter doesn't matter, that it might be holding us back. But I don't want to blame this all on the internet because it was with us before then. This comes actually from kind of the nature of bodies themselves. The philosopher Drew Letter, and maybe Leder, I've only read it, but he notes that we perceive through our organs, right? So because of that, we don't perceive our organs themselves. I don't smell my nasal tissue or hear my ear or taste my taste buds but I perceive through them. And because of this, which is an incredible gift, that our bodies are giving us all this information without us even sort of knowing it or thinking about it. But because of this, we don't notice our bodies when they're functioning properly, typically. We mainly notice our bodies in daily life when they break, when they get sick, or when we're in pain, or when they're damaged in some way or not working. And so this makes it where it's easy to ignore the body or to have a pretty negative relationship with our body, because we only pay attention to it when it uh, seems to be failing. We tend to notice where it goes wrong, right? Otherwise, our bodies disappear, and we begin to think of a self that is somehow separate and separable from our bodies, maybe even held back by our bodies, right? So this is where when in, um, you get poems about death. It's like, I'm in the trees, I'm in the light. You know, we've been held back by our bodies and are set free. This is not a Christian understanding of the body. So why does it matter that bodies matter? Okay, so um, Mark Sayers, who's great, if you don't know him, you should look him up, great Australian teacher, preacher. He, um, he calls um, what we're experiencing now reduced neo-Gnosticism. Gnosticism, as you know, ancient heresy, it's the heresy that will not die. It just keeps coming up throughout the church in different ways. But it's a notion that proclaimed a real dualistic sense of um, a separation of body and soul and a need to kind of transcend our bodies to get to pure spirituality, pure soul. Modern Gnosticism appears to foster shallow... and tr This is... Uh, Sayers that says this, that appears to foster shallow and transient relationships and um, migrate things from the material into the virtual as we've never seen possible in human history. It therefore seems to be a genuine obstacle, this neo-Gnosticism, to the creation of thick communities social bonds, and enduring friendships outside of the online context. All right. So, as Sayers puts it, our reduced neo-Gnosticism is not opposed to material per se. In fact, in some ways, in some group, in kind of subcultures, there can be kind of an obsession with body. But we want a curated body, a mediated body, we want something, uh, it's not that we're opposed to um, embodiment altogether, but we want it, we are opposed to embodiment that's not mediated, that's not enhanced. We want an enhancement of the experience of the material, not just a plain old material. We want something mediating our experiences with our bodies and with each other's bodies, and with the material world. And that begins to feel safer to us. 
Sarah says, the reduced neo-gnosticism of our day wishes to escape the world of the mundane for the world of the awesome, for the stimulating and the pleasurable. Our contemporary Gnosticism wishes to escape our real bodies to become perfected bodies. Through our own efforts, we can smash through the barriers and find happiness through attaining the perfect bodies we see in the imagery all around us online. So examining all of this, it's easy for me to identify with Wendell Berry a great prophet of our age, who says, it's easier for me to imagine that the next great division of the world will be between people who wish to live as creatures and people who wish to live as machines. But I need us to remember together, I need you to help me remember this morning that people cannot live as machines. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and might. Jesus picks this up, this great Shema of Israel, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, Jesus adds mind, and strength, might, and love your neighbor as yourself. Andy Crouch, in his great book, I'll show it to you, I brought it, The Life We're Looking For. It is so good. If you're only going to buy one book this week, buy this book. If you're going to buy three books this week, buy my books and this book. (laughs) If you're going to buy four, buy Jim's. He needs some love. Um, But (laughs) he says, um, I love this. He defines personhood in this as a heart, soul, mind, strength complex designed for love. A beautiful understanding of a person. People cannot be machines. We are heart, soul, mind, strength complexes designed for love. And when we try to make people into machines, this will always result in oppression and exploitation even in the digital age. Andy Crouch, in, this, in his book, talks about how dig- digital technology is a kind of modern quest for magic. It's a quest for what he calls impersonal power. Power without having to engage people. We are, in, that he makes the point that we are not made to be unlimited. We are body-bound creatures, and that is good. And when we seek um, to break free of all of that boundedness, it will result in injustice to the weak and binding of other people's bodies. All right. So before we kind of cash out what this means for worship, I need to quickly kind of theologically run through what's kind of our ground for a theology of the body. And I'm going to do this like quick and dirty and it's not going to be enough, but that's all right. So number one, bodily, um, I'm sorry, number one, we are made as embodied creatures. The narrative of creation that we hold to is not that we're souls damned to a body, which is common in creation myths. That's a common story. It's a radical story that Christians and Jews and Muslims tell about the creation. That we aren't made as souls damned, but instead that we are in spirited dust. That we remain that always. We'll never not be that. We are spirit and dirt together, still today. Number two, bodies matter, and we know bodies matter. We have the best testament that bodies matter because we have a bodily resurrection of a living Savior. Jesus rose in a body. This was such an important part of Christian theology 
that it almost split the early church. Athanasius was exiled like seven times over this. Jesus rose in a body. And this changes everything. This changes everything. He ate. He had scars after the resurrection. That's incredible. This is the sort of thing that people don't, you couldn't make up. Bodies can't be an inconsequential afterthought to the kingdom because we as embodied people encountered a risen embodied God. The story of the resurrection is a story about bodies. All right, moving on. Our bodies in Christian theology are eternal and holy things. Augustine said that bodies are not ornaments. The body, he says, belongs to the very nature of man or of humanity. He says man, I'll say humanity. Body, um, Christians were so committed to the body at the beginning. <laughs> I didn't know if I was going to include this, but that they would, hold, they would go to burial grounds and hold parties on the burial grounds with the dead. And Augustine saw this, and he was like, this is a little weird. Uh, but I'm not going to stop him. I can't stop him. So let's just make it Christianier. Let's just, <laughs> let's just make it holier. And they, so these bodies became like wor worship services around the dead. Still in this day in Anglican churches. You'll have, uh, this is why I wish we had, we had burial grounds around churches. But in Anglican churches, you'll have um, columbariums, the ashes of the dead, because um, we are worshiping with the dead. Um, all right. Augustine said, care for bodies, care for the bodies of the dead is an affirmation of our firm belief in the resurrection. Robert Louis Wilkin, a great uh, church historian, summarizes Augustine saying that there can be no full vision of God without the body. Our bodies are eternal. We will not be spirited away. We will be raised in our bodies. Aquinas said we are a body-soul composite, and unless there is both body and soul, he means after the resurrection, there can be no perfect joy. There will be no perfect joy by all flying away. Perfect joy comes when bodies and souls come together. In Christian uh, theology, we find a friend to the body. Christian theology is a friend to the body. It says that the body is to be embraced. It is not an enemy to be fought. It's not a deceiver. That knowledge of self and knowledge of God and knowledge of the world are going to be embodied and soulish acts. Because of this in the early church, spiritual acts like prayer were embodied actions. And material actions, like caring for the poor, caring for orphans, were kind of bathed and birthed out of prayer. Because of this, because of creation, resurrection, the holy nature of our bodies, human beings are hardwired to need other human bodies. We need other bodies to live. Every single person who is alive in this room today is alive because another human body cared for you. Uh, Andy quotes Sherry Turkle in his book, saying that um, virtual places offer connection, but there's uncertain claims of commitment. We can't count on our cyber friends to come by if we're ill or to celebrate our children's successes or to help us mourn the death of our parents or to sit with us, physically sit with us on long, dark nights, right? And we kind of think we can have both. I try to do this. We all try to do this. We kind of multitask going in and out between the material world and the digital world. And uh, what we're beginning to see 
is that as the digital world captures more and more of our imagination and time and attention, we actually see the material world begins to recede and become less real to us. And this has big consequences. I could go kind of on and on about this. But in April, in the New York Times, there was a report about um, studies of depression and anxiety among teenagers that is skyrocketing. And there's a psychologist, Bonnie Nagel, who says teenagers are actually hanging out with their friends more than ever, but that's online. And she says teenagers who are hanging out with friends online um, don't find the same benefits. She said it's not the same social connectedness that we actually need, and it's not the kind of social connect connection that prevents us from feeling lonely. Because it's true of teenagers and adults. The same week in the Times, they ran a feature highlighting this trend. It's a small trend, but it's building among young people to have romantic relationships with fictional characters and avatars rather than human beings. There is ample evidence right now that teenagers um, and adults as well, uh, under about age 50, are consuming more pornography than ever and having less sex than ever. It's not just that screens kind of are bad for us. It's primarily that all those minutes and hours and days and seconds we spend on screens are taking us away from the material world and life in the material world. Compared with the early 2000s, teenagers are less likely to, this is according to The Atlantic, to go out with their friends, to get a driver's license, to play youth sports. They're less likely to get enough sleep. The National Recreation and Parks Association said children today spend less time outdoors than any other generation before, devoting four to seven minutes to unstructured outdoor play a day while spending an average of seven and a half hours in front of electronic media. I wrote about this in the Times and I realized and confessed there that I can name more apps by sight than I can name species of trees. But claims that we can fundamentally alter how human beings have lived and learned and worshipped together without having just unforeseen, large unforeseen consequences smacks of hubris and reductionism. So brass tacks, what does this mean for being apprentices of Jesus? Number one, our bodies have to be a central part of our individual and communal spiritual formation. Maybe this seems obvious to you. Um, I do not think this is obvious to everyone, and I think increasingly younger and younger generations this is not obvious to. I just want to be clear here, you are being formed through your body, whether you want to be or not. Digital media's message may be that bodies don't matter, but digital media is definitely forming you through your body and through your bodily habits. It's telling you that bodies don't matter, but like all messages, you receive that through your body and through your bodily habits. I tell this story in Liturgy of the Ordinary, so some of you have heard it, but um, I, uh, it's too long to get into. I didn't make my bed. We can talk about it later. Don't judge me. But uh, I never made my bed. And um, so one year for Lent, and what I did when I woke up is I would roll over and I would grab my smartphone and I would just, you know, infotainment for a few, like check Twitter, check whatever, make sure nothing major happened while I was sleeping uh, since I'm the world together. And, um, <laughs> and I, so I would sort of wake up to my phone. And um, for Lent one year, I just banned I decided after a conversation with a weird friend that makes her bed, I don't know. Um, so, so I banished my phone from the room and I just got up and I would make my bed. I'm very messy. My house is messy, and I'm not one of those like, oh, I'm so messy, but like your house is spotless. Like my house is actually messy. You'd be embarrassed <laughs> if you were there. So, um, so I'm, this isn't about the importance of cleaning or anything, but I would make my bed, and I would just sit silently on the bed for a few minutes. And um, 
And I talk, uh, you have to read the book um, to kind of find out what happens next. But it was, a, it was this small liturgy that changed kind of the way I walked through the day. It wasn't life-changing, other than the fact that I wrote a book about it eventually that changed my life. But <laughs> I didn't know at the time it would be life-changing. And um, it was just a small habit. Now, here's what I want to say. Every time I reached for my phone in my groggy morning slumber, my body was forming me in a vision of, of what my life was about, who I am, what I'm for. And Steve Jobs never asked me or required me to say, I believe in Steve Jobs, maker of heaven and earth. Because he was not trying to get to my brain. He was trying to get to my body. And I'm not blaming this on Steve, per se, but his... But technology doesn't ask us to recite a creed, but it works on us much deeper than creeds. We are formed by our body. I have a two-year-old. He's learning to walk. I didn't sit him down and get a chalkboard and explain how to walk. I mean, he he's, he's walks, he runs, he climbs, he would destroy this place. But when he was learning to walk, I didn't sit him down and show him. He learned to walk through his body. Okay, I need to hurry this up. Technology is forming us. Nicholas Carr in The Shallows talks about how digital technology rewires our brains so we can actually take in lots of small snatches of information, but we can't sit, we can't abide with long arguments, long conversations. The result this is going to have on theology in the church is just, un we can't even imagine it now. Um, all right, <clears throat> so if we are being formed by our bodies, if that's inevitable, what happens when we go into worship and it's the same kind of things that form us in normal life, when it's full of screens, when it's kind of passively receiving information? We have to have Christian formation of the body. We need to have baptism in the Eucharist and kneeling and praying and singing. We need to be formed in our bodies. Stanley Harawa said, while we may be able to pray without being prostrate, I think as an institution of the church, I'm sorry, I think an institution of the church could not could no longer be sustained without a people who have first... I'm sorry, let me start this over. Lord, help me. While we may be able to pray without being prostrate, I think prayer as an institution of the church could no longer be sustained without a people who have first learned to kneel. If one wants to learn to pray, one had better learn to bend the body. Learning the gesture and posture of prayer is inseparable from learning to pray. Indeed, the gestures are the prayer. That's what Hauerwas says. I need to say two things here. Number one, teaching matters. Doctrine matters immensely. It's not that. It's not that it doesn't matter, but that to reduce worship or prayer to information reception is to remove the person from a direct encounter with God. To worship in ways that leave our bodies out can make worship into a spectacle, into a show, or to sociology. But when we encounter God, is inevitably through the intimacy of our body. The second thing I just want to say briefly is I know that we can't all kneel. Haruwa said this. Haruwa said multiple knee replacements. I'm not even sure he can kneel now. But that's not what he's talking about. So if you feel left out by this, if your body is different, all of our bodies are different. We can only kind of speak of, of kind of our own experience with this. But if we can have surrogate believers, as we talked about yesterday, we certainly can have surrogate kneelers, right? This is about the church doing this together. Not your body or my body, but our bodies together. All right. Um, Christians need to recover the goodness of the body, but we also need to recover the limits of the body. 
I won't get too much into this except to say that our, when we deal with bodies, we inevitably deal with limitations. We deal with shame over those limitations. The word humility comes um, from the same word as human and the same word as dirt, earth, humanus, humus. This is the word for both humanity and for dust because we are creatures of the dust. Our bodies humiliate us in ways. They humble us. And with this can come all kinds of shame and body shame. We don't like having limits. I can guarantee if I threw up on the stage right now, no matter how glorious anything else was in this whole conference, what you would remember is that Tish Harrison Warren vomited on stage. This would be known as the apprentice gathering where Tish threw up on stage. Because all that bodily weakness is, is, is shocking and revolting to us, right? We only share that part of ourselves with the most intimate people in our lives. We are uncomfortable with our bodily weakness, even though we all have it. But we need to know and embrace the limitations of our bodies to live as creatures. We need to live limited, which is countercultural. If Barry is right that the world is going to be divided between those who want to live as creatures and those who want to live as machines, Christians need to be radically, counterculturally, creaturely, squarely on the side of team creature, right? And we can only do this if we have an unlimited creator. We are not meant for likes or retweets, or crowds, or unlimitedness. We are made for love and communion. And those grow from the particular soil of people and place, of an embodied community and relationships. And lastly, I just want to say that um, because bodies matter, our whole lives matter. Christian ethics, sexual ethics, has to do with more than just getting information about our bodies. The only time, I, I grew up in a church that never kind of talked about bodies. We were very still. We had a TV ministry that kind of communicated, it doesn't even really matter if your body shows up here. But the one time we heard about our bodies was to tell us, don't have sex before you're married. And I think you shouldn't have sex before you're married. But there was an incoherence there. It was the one time. We didn't need our bodies for anything else. We didn't talk about our bodies. We didn't use our bodies in worship. And I want to say that um, so many of the things that we are struggling with as a church right now come down to a deficient understanding and worship and theology of the body. Race, gender, sexuality, the environment, labor issues and disputes, economic issues, have to do with struggles that at root can be traced back to a poor theology of the body, a belief that bodies don't matter or that some bodies don't matter. The stupid dichotomy in evangelicalism, between evangelism and social justice, between teaching the word of God and loving the poor, comes from this same idea that bodies don't really matter and that it's only spiritual realities that matter. And this is left and right in the church. You pick your issue in the church, most of our modern disputes come down to an insufficient theology of the body that flows from insufficient worship with our bodies. We cannot learn that bodies matter through having a doctrine that bodies matter. It can't be more information in our head. We learn our bodies matter through worship with our bodies. We learn our bodies matter through the way we use our bodies. You're not going to learn from this talk that bodies matter. You're going to learn from the way you use your body the rest of the day what your body is for and if your body matters. We learn that our bodies are made from God by worshiping God with our bodies. 
So to return to the beginning, <laughs> if modernity has been a long forgetting that bodies matter, our task now is to rediscover our bodies. The ancient church offers us an invitation. The early Christians understood that to worship with our souls was to worship with our body, and that what we do with our bodies is what we do with our souls. It's an invitation to be formed in our bodies, to apprentice, even today, our risen Savior, who even today dwells in a body, knows our body, knows our shame and our limits in our body, and is resurrecting us and restoring all things, including our bodies. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I took all your time. Sorry. But. Oh, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> it's the old, where does the 300 pound gorilla sit in the airplane? Anywhere he wants. Yeah. So I'm the 300 pound gorilla of the Apprentice Gathering. Yeah, I've, I say that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow, so much going on here. Um, wow, the depth of all the stuff you were saying. Okay, so if we don't have a lot of time, I'm trying to pick, I have like eight questions. I'm going to go with one. It was interesting uh, from last night's talk, from what John said. People, I've heard this from three people now. Same question. So what happens when we die? Mm -hmm. and, and I gave an answer that involved the body, and you, you touched on it. Say, say more of how you would respond to that idea. Yeah. What happens when you die? The body. I mean, our, yes. Well, it's going to involve bodies. Okay. I think. That's my answer, and it's, I think it's right. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to just give you the most honest answer I can, which is that I don't entirely know. Um, so the hope that Christians proclaim is not that we will just like go off to heaven somewhere, some disembodied world. It is um, that we will, you know, that we will be raised in the body. Right. And that the, um, I believe in the resurrection and the life of the world to come, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That we will be uh, reestablished as body, soul, mind, heart complexes designed for love for yeah. eternity. Now, in this time between the time, right? Like, we have loved ones in the dead. Right. Jesus hasn't come back. Where are they? I don't know. There's a notion of like soul sleep that they're literally just kind of sleeping. Right. Um, that's in the tradition. I uh, I am comfortable with that. I think that's fine. Um, Martin Luther kind of held that. Mm -hmm. He said Jesus is going to come knock on my grave and say, "Brother Martin, get up." Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and I there's a, also you know to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. That's a weird verse. Here's how I'll take that, and I don't know. If I'm being a heretic, you can tell me, but um, it wouldn't be the first time. Uh, but I think... Join the club. Um, I think that death is a great, great tragedy. Yeah. And one of the great things about the Christian faith is that we don't have to cross our fingers when we say that. that we, death is the enemy, and it will be defeated. And so um, the... Any, if there is any separation of our body and soul, that is a diminished state. Yeah. And we have Jesus' comfort in that. We have Jesus' presence in that. Jesus is with the dead. Yeah. As he is the living. Um, and I think there is a place, I think that, that this is where Paul is speaking of, when the world is so dark, we we're experiencing such great suffering and persecution, mm -hmm. that to die is gain you know, that the world is a dark, dark place. But I don't think that our hope is that intermediate state of sort of waiting, you know, right. for the resurrection. I think 
um, that ultimately the hope Christians have always proclaimed is that, that Jesus will establish a new heaven and new earth where we live in bodies for all of time, where there will be a feast, I, and we will eat, and we will um, have bodies. Now, is where it gets real trippy, is that I also think that the resurrection, that when we talk about eternity, we're not talking about like some time in the future that is very long. Mm. Eternity is actually like a different dimension outside time. Right. Mm-hmm. So is it possible that we sort of, that our bodies step into, like I don't know how that yeah. works. but. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that it's not necessarily, like, I don't think that we'll wake up and be like, man, I've been asleep for 50,000 years. Mm-hmm. You know, I, yeah. think, I think that there's a dimension of time. Man, this is like deep into metaphysics mm-hmm. where God uh, reestablishes creation. Right. But we do know from the resurrection that Jesus had a body. Yeah. Right? I mean, they, they could touch it. Yep. Then he walked through a wall. So it was a kind of a weird, it was body. A weird body. It's a different body. And the ascension, so, he still had a body in the ascension. Right. But it it's, left the building. Yeah. Right. And so. Yeah. Um, he was recognized and he wasn't recognized. Who is it? Is it? Then they break bread at Emmaus and go, it was him. Yeah. So, yeah, I think all, all of these things are mysterious. But it's the eating body and yeah. the drinking body. Yes. And a touchable body. Yep. Eating fish on the beach. Yeah. So. It's fascinating. It's. And then, well, then we can get into that. What age is that body going to be? And the church fathers wrote about this all the time. Yeah. They thought a lot about bodies. They did, yeah. And Because um, they didn't have a smartphone. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. That's right. That's really the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You, uh, we could go on, and we will, because I will see you again, and I'm going to get all eight questions answered eventually, just not in front of these fine folks, so... Oh, oh, they're or they're sad. They're s- <laughs> All right, I don't. Know. I mean, I'm not going. Okay, to one more. You want me to? Do. I'll do whatever you want me to do. <laughs> no, I'm the gorilla. <laughs> they, these people need, may need to go to the restroom and stuff. We need to care for because they have bodies. bodies. Yeah. <clears throat> I almost forgot. <laughs> I was a brain on a stick. Okay. <laughs> All right, we will. We'll take a break. Let's give thanks. I don't care, Jim. We will come. We'll do it. All right. Thanks, you, Tish. Thank you. Thank you.